بدأنا بسم الله وبالصلاة الله على رسول الله وآله الأبرار Begin with بسم الله and with صلاة الله upon رسول الله and his righteous family. Sisters, we are making this. This is the, first, the fifth lecture under the title "Sex in Islam." There is nothing better than good jealousy or positive jealousy when it comes to the husband. Jealousy for his wife. The jealousy that makes the husband want to be protected, wants the beauty of his wife to be limited and restricted to him, which is fulfilling the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a jealousy that should be present in the heart of every husband who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. We're not talking about the negative jealousy where the person is doubtful and the person is always uh, fearful and the person who will always jump to conclusions and suspicions and all that. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who wants to preserve and protect his wife in every need. Every need he wants to protect her. Jealousy when he sees someone talking or looking at her. Jealousy when he sees her dressed improperly or jealousy when anything that touches her honor, he gets jealous. And we have given, last time we spoke, we have given uh, the story of one of the companions, uh, where he was so jealous even after he divorced his wife, no one dares to marry her. After divorce, this is how jealous the companion was. Now, when we talk about that, we are referring ourselves to something indirect. Here is something you own, you're so protective, it's all yours, you want to keep it that way. Therefore, it is an obligation upon you to do the same, to preserve yourself and purify yourself for that thing that you want to be preserved for you. And that's why Ibn Abbas, he said, Bin Abbas was attracting the attention of men who think that women are supposed to be beautiful all the time, looking beautiful all the time for them, and they have no senses and no feelings and uh, no desire for anything. Uh, just uh, the husband, uh, the way he looks, comes back from work, whether he's messed up or greased up or filthed up or doesn't matter how he looks. He is someone so desirable and so lovely and so beautiful in her eyes. Well, it is not like that. The wives, the good believing wives, swallow all that pride. They don't say anything. They don't comment because they have a quality called shyness. They don't show it so the person or the man automatically assumes 
that this is something that he doesn't need to do it. Well, definitely, just the way that you like her to be looking good for you, the same way your wife likes for you to be looking good for her, wearing perfume, dressing good, actually it would be uh, very good if you ask her to choose and to buy things for you. Because this will be an indirect way of telling her, what do you like? She will pick that and she will choose for you, especially when you go out. Especially when you go out. A lot of women like to dress their husbands when they go out. Some husbands, they just grab the jeans, the closest jean there, and the same sweatshirt that they wore probably for the past two weeks, and they just head out. Now, women can look a little bit different when it comes to that. Islam, brothers and sisters, attracted the attention uh, toward the sexual need for women uh, in a way that a man is not to just satisfy himself and ignore his wife, as we will see, inshallah. We know that the sex, the relationship, the marriage life, we know that sex is an important part in it. And we know that in order for you to lead a happy life, this desire has to be fulfilled. And it is very dangerous if it's not. It will lead to misery and it will lead to breakup in the relationship. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with, something that doesn't matter how you look at it or what you think of it, it's a reality that we have to face and we have to understand. Also, one of the saddest parts of this relationship where the man normally looks uh, becoming or being selfish. He wants her to look good for him. He wants to be satisfied. He wants, he wants, he wants, and nothing in return. What does that do? Well, this is very negative on the woman. And as I always say, they shy to talk about it. They live their life with misery, and some of them just suppress that suffering or that pain without talking about it. Some of them speak up, and when they speak up, their relation is destroyed. It leads to that. And this is very evident, and I, I see that it's happening a lot. But the worst part of all, this is what the man expects. At the same time, he would do what? First thing comes to his mind is, I want to marry another one. I need a second wife. Well, I mean, you're not taking care of one. This is how the woman's reaction. Here I am sitting here, ignoring me as if just a, a piece of furniture, and now you're looking for another wife, as if you are, mashallah, the man of your era. That's when it becomes extremely offensive to the wife when they hear that. But I have a secret, as I promised before, I have a secret for the sisters about brothers. This secret is, men are like boys. Let's call them big boys. This is a reality. If I asked you a question, who do you think needs love and tenderness? The husband or the wife? Both. Both. You're a good guy. But usually, you would think the woman. It's really the man. Realities. Men don't have the love and the patience and the kindness like women do. This is a special thing that women have over men. Women need it, but they love to give it. Men love to receive it, and they ask for it, and they free themselves from giving it back, and that's where it's wrong. 
women, when they give that attention to men, like the, we're talking husbands and wives, when the wife gives that attention to her husband, to satisfy herself, she satisfied half of her nature, which is loving to give that love for others. The other half is to receive some love. And she normally gets it when she treats her husband that way, her husband reciprocates. Well, most husbands don't do that. And that's where the gap will be. You have a woman giving and taking care of their husband and the husband is not giving. Well, this is, this is the problem that we will see here. Men, big boys. Look why. Uh, by the way, this is uh, yani this uh, uh, breaking of the character of the man and the woman. A woman is doing that. So she's saying that men are in a constant need for someone who pampers them and takes care of them. They need a woman that comforts him all the time, in good time and in bad time. Good time, celebrate with him. Bad time, be sad with him. They want someone constantly like that. They need someone to revive their youth all the time in them. Especially after they reach the age 40. This is the age that they refer to Kharif al-Umr. Kharif al-Umr is like Kharif means fall. And you know you have spring and you have fall, so fall is not as good as spring. But whoever was doing that, uh, yeah, that, that, that lady who's doing that, she's definitely either she is not married or her husband never reached 40 yet. But she has good words. Listen to this. She said, men are different. Smart woman is the one who has the keys to how to pamper her husband. She said, men from the young age, when they're born until age 20, their, their parents are pampering them and taking care of them and giving them all the love and attention that they want. After age 20, until they reach age 40, this is the ambition period of time. They want to seek knowledge and they want to graduate and they want to find a good job and they want to buy a house and they want to buy a nice car. So they are building themselves. That's the time when they want to get married, the time when they want to have children all that. So within this 20 to 40, this is a development time for the man and this distracts his attention from looking for the love and the tenderness that he is in need for. He's busy doing something else. And then after the age of 40, the man has finished and accomplished in most cases, especially if he lives in the uh, Gulf Peninsula, maybe in America it will continue, the crisis will continue after the age 40, having accomplished everything that you want. But usually after the age 40, you have accomplished or you should be accomplishing most of the things that you want. You have a wife, you are married, you have children, and you have a good job and such. At that age, the person starts to look for attention. Like he needs classical love. Like buy him a Corvette. <laughs> After age 40, the trend nowadays is, look at a Corvette in the street, look who's in it, it's someone over 40. So they need that classical love from their wife. So what do they do? Women don't understand that need in them, and those husbands at that age, they don't give them the love. All they're looking for is someone to flirt with them, someone to tease them a little bit. Someone to look sexy for them. Someone to show them that they're still young and still going. Women don't pay attention to that. And it leads to what? I want to marry a second one. So they're marrying a second one not because of anything except they're looking for attention. 
And that is a problem. If a man just for looking for attention, he needs to marry another one, this is a problem. So what is the solution to that? Wives have to be attentive to that age and understand what their husbands are in need for. If they need to quiet them from that aspect, then they have to provide that need that arises usually after the age of 40. Many people think that when it comes to religion, religion ignored this desire, this need between the husband and the, and the wife because they think that the, you know, the Quran and the Sunnah and the companions are way above this and more pure to talk about a relationship like that. Uh, there is some shyness in that and so forth because some religions look at the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife, look at it as filthy and degrading. Degrading of the human being to the level of animals. Even though it happens and it takes place, but they don't value it, they don't talk about it, they don't do anything about it, they look at it as something uh, low. And some of the Muslims think that Islam does the same thing. Well, it is completely the opposite. Islam is very sensitive when it comes to that relationship and the importance of this relationship in the life of every man and every Muslim woman. Therefore, there are commands for certain sexual acts and prohibitions for certain sexual acts. And there are recommendations for etiquettes, how and when and why and what you can and what you can during that sexual relationship or during the uh, marriage life. And there are certain obligatory laws that requires the woman to do or the man to do in order to fulfill that need and that desire. The first thing that Islam has established and put the ground rules for is the confession of the presence of this sexual need. Number two, convicting anyone who is trying or any extreme orientation that tries to seize that right of pleasure for the man and for the woman in any way or to think that it is a filthy relationship or something that needs to be uh, ignored and not spoken about. Also, Islam prohibited those who try to castrate themselves so they will not have that desire and they will not have children, like they will basically make the production of uh, children impossible. We know the companions wanted to do that at the conquest of Khaybar and Prophet Muhammad sallam, prohibited them from doing that. We know that some of the companions came bragging about themselves secluding themselves from their wives. أعتزل النساء أصوم ولا أفتر أقوم ولا أرقم ولا أقرب النساء يعني they were bragging about themselves that I fast and I don't break my fast and I pray all night and I don't sleep and I don't get close to women or to one or to my wife. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directed him with what? I fast and I break my fast, I pray and I sleep and I marry women. And if you're not following my path, you're not in the one of me. So this is an indirect or actually a very direct way of telling everyone that this is an important part in our religion. Also, Islam made a massive encouragement to practice the sexual relationship between husband and wife when Islam encouraged the husband to sleep with his wife by saying, as Prophet Muhammad said, وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَ He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you sleep with your wife, it's a form of charity. You know, when you smile to your brother, it's a charity. It's not charity, it's not by money. Charity can be by money, it can be by money and what we just said? Smile. By sex. No. 
So that companions even asked and worried about that. O oh, Prophet of Allah, a man approaches his wife for something that he desires and he gets rewards for it. In other words, he's already being rewarded. He's doing something he likes. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, attracted our attention to something different. He said, if he had to go and do the same thing with a different woman, he's not his wife, is he sinful? They said yes. He said, so why wouldn't he be obedient when he does it with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts for him to do it? You count the bad things and you don't count the good things. This is one thing that we always need to think about also. Not just by doing the good you are rewarded, whenever you refrain from doing the haram, you're also rewarded. A man who saves himself for his wife and preserve himself and lower his gaze and doesn't do anything that uh, makes him yani, commit any sins toward uh, other women and yani by looking and mixing, touching, whatever. And when I say touching, I mean the least that we can do is shaking hands. Okay, this person is obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam encouraged that act and made it also rewarding. But we have to keep in mind one thing also. Islam understands that the man in his nature, he is the one to go after women, to go after his desire and to ask for it. And he has, the shyness is less and the desire is more. So he is the one who seeks the woman not the other way around. This is a fact and a reality that Islam also understands. He is more in need for her when it comes to that, and he is less patient to be away from her also when it comes to that, regardless of how beautiful the woman is, regardless of the beauty. And this is a reality that Women should not fear for their beauty because every man, her husband, will definitely find something that pleases him in her. See, women is like uh, a game room. If you go to a game room, you'll definitely find a game that you like to play. There are game room, you have so many different games, and if you cannot kind of find a game, then you're not on this planet, because when they make it, they make it uh, for every, we are in the games that almost everybody plays. Woman is the same way. Every husband will find something that he enjoys in his wife, and it will suffice him. So they don't have to worry about their beauty. The attractiveness of the woman is hidden. The attractiveness of the woman is hidden and the man has to look for it. As for men, it is apparent, it is superficial. The attractiveness of men, it is superficial. And we will give you, an, especially in what? The most attractive part of the man is his pocket. <laughs> the credit card. Shit. Well, look, look, look at this man, a millionaire, he was a question, they told him, to whom do you owe your success as a millionaire? He said, to my wife, to my lovely wife. He said, mashallah, some kind of woman. What were you where before you married her? He said, a billionaire. Very attractive. He was a billionaire, he married her, now he's a millionaire, and you can tell what happens to the millions. <laughs> For that reason, you see a lot of men like men who are dressed in a suit. You know, too many pockets, big pockets. It cannot be all empty. I mean, you 
have nice pockets from the inside, nice pockets from the outside, everywhere you look at pocket. And some men, out of ignorance, when they want to display their beauty, they actually lose their beauty. Mm -hmm. Anyone understood that? Mm -hmm. He's not sure of how much wealth they have. Huh? He's saying they're trying to show off how much wealth they have, but they turn out. <laughs> no, no I'll, I'll keep that as a secret for you. Do you try to translate that? <laughs> the beauty is outside. The beauty of the women is inside. A man has to look for the beauty of a woman. A woman sees it from the outside generally. We're not talking that he has no beauty whatsoever. No, we're talking generally is attractive from the outside. Look at, look at the desire of women, uh, the desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in women when it comes to money. There is a desire for sex, but not bigger and stronger than the money. If a man walks, a beggar walks by a man and he tells him, you know, it has been a week, I haven't eaten anything. What would you think the man would say? If he was a pious Muslim, he would give huh? him some money. If he was a pious Muslim, he would give him some money. But if he's not he would give him some money. He would help him immediately. If the same beggar passes by a woman and he says, you know, I haven't eaten anything in four days or in a week. A woman more than likely would look at him and say, God, I wish I had your willpower. <laughs> I wish I had your willpower. Mm -hmm. Is this what he's looking for? Yeah. He's looking for money. But at the same time, you don't want to give the money. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated the woman to, sa to uh, surrender to her husband when it comes to his sexual needs. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi if a man calls his wife to bed for that need and she needs to obey him even if she is on a tannur. Tannur is like, it's not a stove of these days, it's like an oven of those old times where you put the bread and the food and everything there and if you turn your back for a few seconds you burn the whole thing. So you have to be very attentive to it to do it. Even if she is in that situation she needs to ignore and forget what she's doing and obey her husband. Look how uh, the command, how strong the command is. Also Islam told us that if a man asked his wife to bed and she rejects him without a valid reason, then she sleeps, she will be, angels will be cursing her until the morning. Why? Because this will lead the man to Allah knows what. If this were to continue or to persist because the need for the man is beyond thinking when it comes to that. Also, this is something, you know, when, when you want to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you think that it is open and free. A woman, if she wants to fast extra, she has to have permission from her husband to fast. She cannot fast without asking his permission. To the point, if she did fast without his permission, and he needs to sleep with her, Guess what? She has to sleep with him, which means she violated the fast. It's not haram on him to do that. It is his right and his right has to be fulfilled before voluntary acts, which is fasting. This is how important it is for a woman to submit to the need of her uh, husband when it comes to sex. Also, as I mentioned, they have the need, and it is there, but always when we talk about it, I just want you to think that comparison-wise. It is less than men. But here I'll give you a story you can relate to. Uthman ibn Mabur he was secluding himself for just being a pious man. Fasting all the time, praying all the time and ignoring his sexual needs. Well, he has good control of his own sexual needs 
but he forgot that he has a partner who has a need for those sexual needs that he's controlling. Just like she's fasting, ignoring her husband, and he has it. Well, the same way he's doing that and she has needs. The difference is the right of the husband is more than her right upon him when it comes to that because of the magnitude and the level of that desire uh, between men and women. So, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, entered the house of Aisha عنها, and some women were there and he noticed that one of the women looked very depressed and very sad. So he asked Aisha عنها, what's wrong with her? So Aisha عنها, asked her somehow and told uh, Aisha عنها, that her husband is very busy serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the shyness. She did not say, well, he doesn't have time for me to satisfy me. He doesn't have... He's very busy with his worship, meaning he doesn't have time for me. My needs are not being fulfilled. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu immediately he went and met with Uthman radiallahu an, and he told her, can't you take me as an example for you? So he said, Bi abhi anta ummi, ma? O Prophet of Allah, of course, why not? I am. What should I do? He asked him, he said, do you fast all day? He said, yes. He said, do you pray all night? He said, yes. Then he told him, don't do that. إِنَّ لِجَسَدِكَ حَقًّا وَلِأَهْلِكَ حَقًّا For your body has rights on you and your wife has rights upon you. Now he heard that advice naturally, immediately he fulfilled that. He fulfilled that and he went back to his house and he did what he's supposed to do. He gave the rights to his wife. Now after this desire subsided, she went back to the house of Aisha عنها, and she was very happy, talking, and joking and everything to the point that her friends noticed something different. You, know, you were depressed and everything and all of a sudden you have a good time. What's going on? Look how a beautiful shy answer when they asked her what's going on she said, she said, Asabana ma asaban nas. I got a portion of what you all get. Yeah, look, look, look at the uh, look at the words, how she put it. And this is the shyness that we always say that women have. And that's why you find a lot of women suffer because they don't express themselves, they're too shy to ask. This woman radiallahu anha, the wife of uh, Uthman, she never came and complained to anyone. She was just depressed. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi found out. So, her problem was solved by a coincidence. And believe me, many women out there are suffering from the same thing and people don't realize it, especially their husbands. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he said that a man should sleep with his wife at least once every four days. Assume that the man have four wives. The first one will get her turn four nights after. This is an assumption. Now is this a law? Is this something that we should abide by? No. As, as long as the need is there and as long as the person is capable of, then this need needs to be fulfilled and that is the uh, right path that everyone uh, should follow. But remember also, Islam prohibits us from indulging ourselves in luxuries of this life. So just because the person has the desire doesn't necessarily mean that he needs to do it all the time. Because you want to leave something for attraction. You want to leave something 
in case uh, and, and the, 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 there should be always a desire left. This is like when you eat. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, "Thuluth lil taha, thuluth lil ma, thuluth lil hawa. One third for food, one third for water, one third for air. The same thing. In other words, leave some room in your stomach." And the scholar said, "You should leave." or stop eating, when you have a feeling like the next spoon that I eat, and that's it, I just need one more spoon, stop, don't take that spoon. Leave that desire in you before you take it. So this is the same way when it comes to the sexual relationship. You always want to leave some attraction between you and, and your wife, not to keep doing, doing, doing until you bore yourself in her. And at the same time, uh, this is also, as I mentioned, it is not recommended in Islam to do anything excessively because this is beyond what we need. Islam encouraged not only the relationship but to uh, the, the approach to that relationship. Islam doesn't want a man or a husband to uh, approach his wife like animals do. This is not copulation. This is called love making. Love making is different than just simple sex. When you make love, there are ingredients. There are things that you need to do. There are things that you need to start. There are times. So think of it this way. It is not something that straightforward and you just want to go and do something. It's not a job that you someone assigns for you. Do it and then it's over. It is something that has to be planned, that has to be uh, done in a proper way that suits the man and it suits the woman. You know, this is, in other words, there should be some romance, there should be some foreplay, there should be some sweet talk, there should be some touching, there should be all of those things have to be present. This is like one, one man from Jordan, without mentioning any names. <laughs> uh, he, he was trying to flirt with the, with the woman and he said, what is, uh, I can't have a lot of Time of happiness. People forget usually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the first thing you start with is prayer. You pray, then you make the Eid, and that is a sign that you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anything. He said, he said, لِيُقَدِّمْ أَطَّلَطُفْ بِالْكَلَامِ وَالتَّقْدِيرِ وَمَا شَابَهَ ذَلِكُ وَلَا يَقَعْ أَحَدُكُمْ عَلَى مْرَأَتِهِ كَمَا تَقَعْ الْبَهِيمَةِ He said he should start by soft talk, by kissing, by some things like that, foreplay, and let no one start or sleep with his spouse the way animals do. Animals don't have that foreplay thing, they just do it. One of the people, I don't know what, what he's got with this, talking about kissing and uh, talking, uh, he's uh, something that I found, for kisses there are meanings. And if you kiss someone on the nose, <laughs> if you kiss someone on the nose, this is, uh, this is Bidwin style. Ah, I guess we have a bit of a man here too. <laughs> if you kiss on the cheek, this is French. On the hand, it is loyalty. On the head, it is respect. On the mouth, it is love. On the neck, it is desire. On the ear, it is passion. On the leg, it is devotion. And remember, as a Muslim, you go for what? When it comes to obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do what? You go for the max, maximum obedience. You don't, you want to go to what? Jannah or to Firdaus? To Firdaus. So the more the act is closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the one that you seek. Also the scholar said it is a dysfunction in the relationship of the man if he sleeps with his wife without comforting her, without talking to her, without any foreplay. This is considered a deficiency in the husband because as I said, for men it may not be necessary for women, it's like a must. So this is something. Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, said, to the point, look, Imam Ghazali, when you're talking about that, him and Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said, إِذَا قَضَى وَطْرَهُ فَلْيَتَمَهَّلْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ حَتَّى تَقْضِيهِ نَهْمَتَهَا فَإِنَّ إِنْزَالَهَا رُبَّمَا يَتَأَخَّرْ وَهَذَا إِذَاءُ لَهَا and for, for those who speak Arabic, if you, if you listen to those statements, it tells you how precise the scholars spoken about those things that we hardly hear about or no one talk about and people are suffering because of that. He said, if the man fulfilled his desire, meaning he reached the climax, he should slow down and give time for his wife to reach her climax. Because if she is delayed after him and she doesn't reach the climax, it's going to harm her or she will be saddened, she will be harmed by that. And he added, what fi and And he said, and to reach the climax at the same time, is the most pleasurable, pleasurable for both, especially for her. And then he added, وَعَلَى الزَّوْجِ أَنْ لَا يَشْتَغِلْ بِنَفْسِهِ عَنْهَا فَإِنَّهَا رُبَّ لَا تَسْتَحِيمُ Look at that. And the husband should not ignore her and busy himself with fulfilling his need because she is shy. She is not going to ask for it. She's not going to talk, she's not going to do many things because of the shyness and that will lead to the depression that she will feel if she did not get the desire fulfilled. So this, this tells you what? This tells you that even, even if the woman is shy, she should build some 
confidence with her husband. If there is an understanding husband, they should talk about things like that and build the confidence where she can express herself. That's number one. Or the husband has to understand all of those and provide it for her without her asking for it. This is how to solve that. Also, and Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah yaqul, Hadyuhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi al-jima' wa la yajidu fi dhalika harajan diniyan wa la aiban akhlaqiyan wa la naqsan istima'iyan kama qad yafham ba'd al-nas fi asli. He said the guidance of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is so perfect. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not have any uh, reservations, religious-wise, talking about it, or any uh, shyness, uh, yani when it comes to manners and etiquettes, to talk about it, or any wrong thing socially to talk about it. He spoke about it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, none of those was present when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam expressly talked about that, him and the companions of Allah, and contrary to what Many people think nowadays. And he said, one of his words, <laughs> He said, the guidance of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in sexual uh, relationship, sexual love between a husband and wife, he said it was perfect guidance. When we say perfect guidance, we mean it is from A to Z. It's not just indirectly hinting. There were ayat exactly and specifically saying it and mentioning it where you would probably be shy to even talk about it to some other people. Yet Prophet Muhammad was not shy to talk about it. And he said that. He has the perfect guidance and he added, with this relationship, with sex, he said, you maintain your health and you fulfill your desire. This is the word of Imam Ibn Qayyim Rahimahullah. Sex has what? Has three purposes in Islam. Number one, to preserve the human being, to preserve our offsprings, to get rid of the fluid that if it gets congested, it is harmful to the body, and that's why people have wet dreams. And that is for men and women. Many people think that wet dreams are special for men. It's for men and for women. And I don't know if I, uh, probably in the beginning, I said a hadith about, yeah, we talked about that. We talked about that in some of the wives of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu told the other woman who asked about that, he said that you have blew our cover uh, or our secrets. So, why? Because if that doesn't take place, then the person or the body will be harmed. And that is why Ibn Qayyim said you preserve your health with this act, with your spouse. Another one is to get the pleasure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made a consequence for this act. There is a pleasure in it, and that's why people like to do it. And this is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should enjoy and you should be grateful and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that a ni'mah leads you to Jannah also, because it is rewarding. And he said also, from the benefits of a sexual relationship with your spouse, you lower your gaze, you protect yourself from haram, and uh, the same way you please your wife and you benefit yourself in this dunya and in the hereafter. And that is why, this is the wording of Ibn Qayyim, that is why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to like it and used to do it. And he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ مِن دُنْيَاكُمْ أَنِّسَاءُ Among the things that I love the most from this dunya, even mine, dunya, not the hereafter, perfume and his wives. Long hadith uh, about that to 
tell you what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mean by that, so you don't misunderstand. But I'll give you just a quick hint that he وسلم, said that because if the man fulfill his sexual need, his mind is stable. His thoughts are good. He's not busy with anything. If he's not sexually, uh, his sex, his sexual desire fulfilled, his mind cannot be focused, cannot concentrate on things. He's always think of, thinking about it. And once you do that, the mind is much. So, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, loves the best is what? Prayer. So, imagine a person going to work when he is not in need for sex. Alhamdulillah, his life is good and everything is fulfilled. He goes to work happy, he can work happy, he concentrates in his prayers, all of that, nothing to distract his mind. So one of the main reasons, that is one reason for uh, this, it helps you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from harm. What about perfume? Perfume go, perfume and sex go hand in hand. That's why women are not supposed to, to wear perfume where men can smell them. Because perfume interacts with the ruh, with the spirit of the person. And it pleases them. So if your spirit is pleased and your body is pleased, then you have fulfilled complete pleasure. And that is why men has to wear that cologne all the time and women have to wear the perfume for their husbands, not outside. Otherwise, a woman will be considered like she committed zina. It is haram. A human right stopped فَمَرَّتْ بِقَوْمْ لِيَجِدُوا رِيحَهَا فَهِيَ زَانِيَةً Any woman who wears perfume, she passes by men, and they smell that perfume, she has committed a form of zina. It is not a joke, because perfume arouses the desire of sex in men without limits. And that is another thing that we're trying to limit them, we're trying to control them, we're trying to eliminate that from being in the public, from so people can help lower their gaze and all that, and this definitely does the opposite, and that is why it is so haram and it leads to zina. Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah also said that people think that when you uh, talk about the fuqah in Islam that Muslims are awkward and Muslims are primitive and Muslims they are back in everything or behind in everything especially when it comes to relationship between husband and wife as you can see here then definitely this is far off it is the defect in ourselves not in our religion our religion has everything that we need when it comes to fulfilling our sexual needs Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah said uh, that Asbir an al ta'am wa sharab wa la asbir an hun. He added uh, to the hadith where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, From your world, what I like is my wives and perfume. He said, I can control my hunger, I can control myself from eating food and drinking, but I cannot control myself from sexual need with my wives. This is uh, something that even Prophet Muhammad told us and encouraged us to get married. And he said, why? Because it helps you lower your gaze and at the same time, it chased yourself. And if there is no love and understanding between the husband and wife, how can you fulfill that need? How can you fulfill that desire? Here, you have someone that is all yours, your wife, and she has someone that is all hers, her husband, and this is all you got, and that's what she got. <coughs> Definitely, you want to take advantage of everything that you could think of to enjoy yourself all the way, as long as it is not haram, it's not contradicting our religion, where we see the opposite, people are
start limiting themselves and controlling themselves and fearing and cutting relationship and uh, destroying basically their life, either forbidding themselves from too much pleasure or breaking their marriage simply because they refuse to learn their religion and to break the barriers that they have grown up with. Uh, like some people say, this is too uh, excessive, or this is shyness, or you should not be doing this, or saying this, or this is haram, or this is uh, manners, or good manners and bad manners. Who decides good manners and bad manners? Our religion. Our religion. You cannot say that our religion approving something if you do it or if you say it that you have bad manners or no good manners. Inshallah, I will be talking more about the topic. We'll stop here. And if you have any questions relating to the topic, inshallah, we can take some questions. Remember, you can go to sunnahfollowers.net or to imamhassanfalil.wordpress.com to listen for more lectures or to see that if you are not uh, able to come to the question. Question is why man is allowed. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad al-Mustafa. Allahumma salli.